So today we're going to talk about my automation that I'm doing in the greenhouse. So it's a video I've been wanting to make for a little while now. Um, it's just about getting the time to do it. So hopefully this can do it justice. I'll probably do a few videos in this series just to go through some of the specifics about what I'm doing. This video is a bit of a high level view of, of what I've actually done. I'll go over the, the various components of the system as well as some of the uh, mistakes I've made, some of the ideas I've had, um, some of the changes I want to make as well. Uh, future videos will go maybe into some of the specifics around some of the code that I've put in, um, the website that I've created, how to monitor it, how to uh, optimize what it's actually doing. So firstly when I came up with the idea of doing the uh, automation uh, I've been working on some level of automation for a little while now um, but when I moved home I wanted to do something uh, on a bit of a bigger scale as you can see behind me I've got quite a big greenhouse there and really enjoy growing my chili peppers so I wanted to mix a bit of that hobby with some of my other hobbies programming um, automation internet of things that sort of thing so at the heart of it it all starts with that thing there the solar panel um, it's a 100 watt solar panel when the sun is directly on it I get I get over 100 watts sometimes out of it um, and that there that runs into a box that's sitting behind there it's a waterproof box and inside it is a leisure battery so that's the one of the first things you've got to research uh, the solar panel is easy enough you've got to work out how much power you're gonna need 100 watts seems to be a good one anything less uh, you could probably get away with but I would say 100 watt for what I've been doing for the amount of systems that I have running on this I think 100 watt panel works well especially in the UK um, to be honest I sized this for winter not for summer if it was just for summer and uh, we could guarantee full Sun all the time then probably get away with a 20 watt panel but because we live in England in the winter time you don't get a lot of direct sunshine so um, you, you need something a bit bigger so that you can get as much energy out of it as possible so 100 watt solar panel that goes into a uh, into a battery that I've measured out as 130 amp hour battery uh, again you probably could get away with something something a little bit smaller but I wanted to make sure that I had a lot of headroom so if I went a week without any charge coming through on the solar panel because we've had rain or whatever then I still want the, the systems to run so we've got the battery uh, it's a leisure battery so something that can be discharged quite a lot without damaging the battery if you use just a normal car battery you're gonna have some problems because car batteries aren't built for uh, the type of work that this will be doing this is you can call it a leisure battery, a marine battery, a caravan battery that allows you to, to really discharge it quite a lot without damaging it. First thing I wanted to do is make sure I could monitor what, I, what the battery was doing, what the charge was doing, how much energy is coming in, how much energy is going out. So I bought myself a charge controller that I could interface with um, so that I could connect to it with a microcontroller like an Arduino or um, in my case an ESP8266 um, so that was the next part to decide on the brains of the system and I've got one over here this is a Wemos D1R2 and that little component there is actually the ESP8266 you could get you could get away with just using that thing over there but there's a few reasons I got this thing here this costs you about five dollars and the biggest benefit for me is the fact that it has this that allows 9 volts to 24 volts input and obviously the battery that's over there it's not always running at exactly 12 volts it could be running at 13 could be running at 12.2 it's going to fluctuate a little bit um, and I wanted to make sure that I had something that could take in that amount of power and be able to you know keep running not blow up so you could get something that runs off 5 volts so I mean this does run off 5 volts as well you can see there the, the USB input um, and then just get a converter and play around but you're gonna have a lot of loss of power um, loss, loss of energy when you do conversions of power um, I'm sure you have loss in this but this is actually quite a high quality um, 
uh, converter. So don't lose a lot of power when this is when this is running through 12 volts. So why did I choose the ESP8266? For a couple reasons. Um, I mean, let, let's talk about what options you have first. Um, today, you have so many options with uh, you know the electronic hobbyist. You have the Arduino, which has been around for quite a while, and you have the awesome Raspberry Pi. Um, I did consider the Raspberry Pi. I've done some other projects with the Raspberry Pi, but there's a few reasons I chose not to use that. The two main ones, number one, I didn't want something that could crash. The Raspberry Pi is a computer. It's running Linux, um, and you know there's more chance for something to go wrong. Whereas with a microcontroller like this or the Arduino, it's it's a microcontroller. So it, yes, it has some form of an OS running in the background, but nothing like what Linux is or Windows, for example. So this thing here, it's sort of machine. It, it's a machine and you switch it on it doesn't have to boot up and run a bunch of drivers or anything like that it just literally starts up within a few seconds and it's running if it crashes which is far less likely than with the raspberry pi it recovers very quickly and gets up and running um, with the raspberry pi you sometimes get stalls you sometimes get some problems and if i'm away for uh, a few weeks and I want my greenhouse to keep running and my plants to keep getting watered, then I've got to make sure that I have something that I can rely on. So that brought it down to the Arduino and the ESP8266. So I already told you I'm using the ESP8266. Um, in this form factor, it's the Wemos D1R2. The reason for that is I wanted to monitor this remotely. I wanted to connect to it um, onto my Wi-Fi. Uh, it's a little way away from the house, so you know, Wi-Fi is the only real way I wanted to do this. I didn't want to run a cable across the lawn. So the ESP8266 is a Wi-Fi enabled microcontroller, which is pretty awesome, um, especially when you can get this whole unit here for five pounds or five dollars. Um, I've got quite a few of them now because there's so many projects you can use this with. Um, the Arduino, you can enable Wi-Fi on it, but you need to have a separate shield, um, an extra component that you put onto it, and that allows you then to use the Wi-Fi. I want something all built on. I didn't want to mess around, and this just does the job. I actually have two of these running in the greenhouse. So one's in the greenhouse, and one is in the box where my battery is. The one in the box with the battery is just monitoring the health of the battery and also it's monitoring what's coming in, what's going out um, in terms of the solar power or the energy that I'm actually using in the greenhouse. The charge controller is, I chose it, the specific one I chose, I chose it because I wanted one I could interface with. And interface with it in the sense of all the information that's sitting on that charge controller I want to be able to see what it is. Uh, I want to see it remotely. Obviously, I can go to the charge controller and I can skip through the menu buttons and I can see, you know, how much power's come into the system, how much power's gone out. I can see all that, but isn't it even better if I can do it remotely? Um, so that's what I did. I got this charge controller. It's uh, uh, EP Solar. Um, it's a 10 amp charge controller. So that means that it can have an input and an output of 10 amps. Um, I kind of worked out that that's the maximum that I'd want to put through my system. You can go for the 20 amp if you want. Um, it all depends on, on what you're actually going to use inside your, inside your greenhouse. So that's the charge controller, the battery, the ESP8266, um, you know, the, the actual computers behind everything. The solar panel um, and then it comes down to what I'm actually doing with all this first things first water plants need water so the first thing I have to think about is getting some pumps in there um, obviously I need a 12 volt pumps because I want to make sure that it can run without having to do any power conversions. first mistake I made was I bought this so this here uh, if any if you guys have looked into doing 
um, any sort of automation using 12 volt pumps. I'm sure you come across these on eBay or on Amazon. They're cheap pumps that look like they should do the job, right? I think I paid about six pounds for this, for this one. Um, I bought two of them because I, I'll explain why I'm using two pumps, but I bought two of them. The problem you have is flow rate. So all I was looking at was the pressure and I looked at the fact that there was a hundred PSI that this pulls across and I thought yeah well pressure that's that's what I need. I need pressure to be able to push the water around. No you need flow rate. So the pressure on this is a hundred PSI. Now if you think about it your tap in your house or your tap your garden tap is running at about 30 PSI around about. Your garden tap is going to be letting out far more water than this will. So what happened? Um, I connected up my entire drip system. I put this pump in place and it was leaking everywhere. As soon as I added any more of the um, drippers along the line, so when I had more than just a few drippers that I was using for a test, suddenly some drippers were working quite well, others not working so well. Um, and when I try and limited, try to limit how much, uh, how many drippers I had on the system to see what was going on, all that was happening is the pressure was building up way too much and water everywhere. So I learned my lesson: don't go cheap when it comes to the pump, and don't go get a high pressure pump because drippers work on mains water pressure. So I had to rethink everything and I ended up spending quite a bit more money and I got proper caravan uh, pumps. So we're inside the greenhouse now and uh, these are the pumps. So you can see they're substantially bigger than the pumps that, oh, well, the pump that I was showing you earlier. You can see the size of that, that's pretty large. So I've got two of them. Now why do I have two? Well, firstly, before we get onto that, uh, just pointing out why these are here. These have filters. If you don't cover them up, it's going to start growing algae in here. So this here is just to cover over it, so it limits the amount of algae. You want to clean that off as, as often as you can, just to make sure that this whole system runs the way it should. So two pumps. One pump is for running the system. So you can see here that pump there, it comes down to this. That pumps up, comes through here, and splits off into two and goes around the entire greenhouse. And comes off at various areas where it then comes off to these small runners which then drip out. So I've got a few different types of drippers. This one here is an adjustable one, like you can see there. And then you'll see back there, that's just a plain dripper, four liters per hour dripper. You'll notice I have the first pump, um, the one that's actually running in down here, um, that that runs this the runs the drippers. You'll see that it's connected into this multi-link over here. Uh, it's for a couple reasons. Um, one, I can actually switch off the tap here for the outlet to the drippers, and I can instead plug in a hose pipe if I want to do something else if I want to use the water in here to either empty this bucket or if I wanted to water something outside I could do that if I wanted to. The other reason is if I want to release some pressure I have this here running um, you'll notice it goes up it goes straight back into here so if I want to release the pressure a little bit uh, I don't want too much pressure going through to the to the drippers, I can just switch that on a little bit and I can control the pressure. So here you can see I have this on about half, um, so it just feeds water back into the into the main bucket. So the second pump, if you look here I have this big barrel here. So this barrel is about 200 liters. If you're watering plants on an automated system and you want to feed them then you've got to make sure you have a system like this, right? So that's one of the reasons, it's because I want to feed it. So I use Chili Focus. I might give something else to try next year, but at the moment I'm using Chili Focus. I dilute that into this when I fill it up. And that then will make sure 
that I'm feeding the plants as I should be. So if we take a look outside, you can see I have a few water butts. So there's one over here that's coming off that end. There's one over here that's coming off here. And these are all connected up to each other. So I have a whole line of them there. So there's four over there, five and six. Now, all the water that comes off the roof are going into these water butts. So I have a lot of water available to me. So you look in here, we're about, about half full, um, which means I have about six, 700 liters of water. Now, the pump inside is connected down the end here. So that hose pipe, that goes in over there and that pumps water, pulls it from these barrels which are all interconnected. Like I said, I want to make sure I keep the dilution rate correct with the, uh, the fertilizer. But the other reason is plants don't really like it when the temperature of the water is vastly different from the temperature of the soil. If you can imagine, uh, the temperature inside the greenhouse is about four or five degrees warmer than it is in the outside at the moment because it's not a very sunny day. Um, but on a really sunny day, this could be about 10, 20 degrees warmer, especially in the winter. And when the soil inside the greenhouse is 20 degrees warmer than the water that's going to get poured on it, you might shock the roots. So by having the water come in into there, you're making sure that the water gets up to the same sort of temperature as the water as the soil is for the plants so it's really just to help the plants out a little bit so that's the pumps so the pumps are the first thing i wanted to get done the second thing is air movement because we're in a greenhouse uh, even though i have got these auto opening vents i've got quite a few of them as you can see over there you can also notice there's a lot of fans in here so when i started out i actually only had two fans i had those two up there but I've just figured I actually need a bit more than just those two fans. So these fans, um, I would have liked to have gotten bigger fans, which might have meant that I wouldn't need as many as I have here. The problem is when you're looking for 12 volt fans, this is about as big as it gets. Um, I have seen online uh, a bigger fan, but we're talking about six or seven times the price of this. So it really wouldn't make a lot of sense. So in the end, I just got six of these um, they're oscillating fans so they do move around which is quite handy the other fan didn't actually do that um, but these oscillate so it moves the air around quite nicely they are 12 volt so like i said before you don't want to be doing conversions of the uh, power um, so the fans aren't necessarily to you know it's not to cool down the, the greenhouse that's what people tend to think when I when I show them the fans it's actually just to give some movement around you to strengthen up strengthen up these plants if they don't have air on them or wind or anything like like what we've got running here then these branches will just fall over so you can see this is quite a sturdy branch um, so the air movement actually will just make sure that these plants stay nice and strong but the other reason is for pollen so um, in another video, I've showed you that um, these plants, uh, they pollinate themselves. So there's a lot of pollen sitting there. Um, luckily, I do have uh, bees in here and insects. So I've never really had too much of a problem with the pollination. You can see you've got loads of pods, loads of them coming through. The, if you didn't have bees uh, or enough bees coming in, you want to make sure that the fans are going to blow the pollen around and that will also help things to pollinate. So fans are just a good idea. Um, the last reason actually to have fans is when it gets really moist in here and humid, you want to make sure that the air gets circulated a bit and moves around. Um, else you get a lot of algae growing up on the windows. You can see I'm actually quite lucky I don't have a lot in here. I might be a different story in winter, but I'll still have these fans run every now and then in winter. So that's the fans. And then the last bit is a bit of lighting. So if you look right at the top there, that there is a strip of LEDs running all along the top. 
and that just lets me come in here in the night time and be able to actually see what's going on you can see there are a couple other things but i'm not really automating it this here is just a, a time lapse that i'm running against some plants uh, some chili peppers that are growing i have another time lapse camera over here both of these are running off the battery um, those are raspberry pi zeros actually in there uh, to to do the time lapse of sending pictures to an ftp site that i have but that's not automated i'm not really controlling that with my system that i'm running the mains power comes in this cable down here comes into this box and then it splits it out so that cable is splitting all of these out here and going into this so in here is the wemos d1r2 as well as four relays so those relays are what the wemos d1r2 are is activating the relays are what switch on the power off and on so that's why i have two switches on here one is to the relays and one is to the actual wemos itself this here is just a um, temperature and humidity monitor so i can actually see what the temperature is inside here as well as the humidity i have another one that's actually this cable here um, this one here actually goes outside so i can monitor what the temperature is outside so i can see a differential between what's happening inside what's happening outside something else to show you um, i have showed in a different video I had to think about how I monitored the amount of water that's going in here when I use the second pump. Being able to tell whether I've whether it's filling or overfilling. There's a few ways to do that. You could do it with an electronic switch that will monitor when it reaches a certain level. But I thought, let me just go old school, nice mechanical. And there you can see it's just a cistern type ball valve. When the water gets up to a certain level, it stops. So you can see here, that there, when it gets to this level, it's gonna stop pouring in. So I could switch the pump on now, it won't run at all because it is full. But if it was empty, it would fill up until it gets to that point and then put back pressure on and the pump will stop working. So let's take a look at how I'm monitoring everything and how I can control what's going on in the greenhouse. This is the website that I've created. This is just an overall monitoring of what's going on. So these, this screen over here, where we have the picture of the, the solar panel, we have the picture of the solar con charge controller and the battery. All this information is coming from the, the Wemos D1R2 that is sitting inside the waterproof box outside of the greenhouse. That's just monitoring what's happening. There's a lot of information that you can get from the from the uh, solar charge controller. The information that was more interesting to me, that's what I have up here. So you can see a few things here. You can see the, the temperature of the charge controller at the moment. It's 37 degrees. I can see the temperature of the battery is running at 29.6. The voltage currently, what it's putting out. So the solar panel doesn't tend to put out 12 volts. It'll put out a bit more than that and the charge controller will convert that and produce the amount of power that's required to charge the battery. Um, at the moment, it's it's only running at 14 watts, but it's quite a sunny day outside. And for example, if I switch on the fans, I know that it's gonna start using quite a bit of power. You see the load at the moment is about six watts, but I switch on the fan, this will go up to about 60 watts. And because of that, it will actually start pulling more energy in from the solar panel to keep the battery topped up. The fans kicked on pretty much straight away. As soon as that turned green, the fans are actually on. So in the greenhouse at the moment, the fans will be running. The, uh, this information hasn't updated yet. You'll see it'll update in a second. I only update every two minutes or so. You can see the power now, it's drawing 71 watts, which is five amps. And the solar panel has jumped up as well to producing 75 watts because there is direct sunlight on it at the moment so 75 watts is producing 4.46 amps at 16 volts and you can see over here the charge current is coming in at 5.65 amps even though the solar panel is only producing 4.46 amps but because it's at 16 volts this does a conversion to 12 volts and it allows this to charge at a bit of a higher ampage so the wattage is still the same but the amps have gone up 
So that's what the charge controller, a decent charge controller would be able to convert the energy more efficiently than a, maybe a cheaper one. And then down here, this section over here is how I actually control what's going on in the greenhouse. So like you just saw, I switched on the fans. I could switch on the pumps now as well. Pump one is the pump that I have running the drippers and pump two is the pump I have to fill up the reservoir that I have inside the greenhouse. And then I have the lights as well. So I could switch that on now. That wouldn't be a problem. You'll see that that that'll kick in. This looks this looks for changes that so if I press this button, it looks for change every 20 seconds or so. And there you go, it's jumped on. So the lights will be on for 15 minutes now. Or if I click it again, lights off and that'll switch off in about 10, 15, 20 seconds. Down here, some more interesting information. This again is coming from the second ESP8266 or WEMOS. This is the information um, inside the greenhouse. So the internal humidity at 13%, internal temperature at 33%, and external temperature at 29%. Now that's not entirely accurate. I do live in England at the moment, and if we had 29 degrees, we'd all know about it. It'll be in the news. Um, it's just my positioning of that external temperature uh, sensor. So I need to find a better place to put it so that it gives me a more realistic reading. So down the bottom here, you would have seen there's a couple of pictures. So the two time-lapse cameras that I have running, I have it also sending a, a small snapshot just so I can see what's happening to see if I need to move the cameras. Um, you know, obviously plants grow and they might get out of position for the camera lens. Um, yeah, you can see this one. Also, I want to make sure it's still in focus and make sure it's still working okay. So back to this. This here, we can see there's, a, there's a few options we have to look at some information. So there's aggregates over here by day, month, and year. So I can have a look and see what sort of consumption I have per day. Um, this is when I started generating the stats on the 6th of November. But if I come back to today, we can see that, well, yesterday would be more realistic because today is not over yet. But yesterday we consumed 0.11 kilowatt hours and we generated 0.17. So if we have a look down here, you can see there on the 9th, it was a pretty crappy day and we only generated 0.04 kilowatt hours, but we still consumed quite a bit. And the day before as well, because it was a rainy day and we didn't get a lot of sunshine. But these other days made up for it. So you can see the day after this generated 0.32 kilowatts and I, gener I consumed 0.18. Um, but as it evens out, you can see there's less of a gap in between, so 0.11 to 0.17. Most days it will be somewhat similar to each other. Um, it will only generate as much as it uses or a little bit more. When, when you have a day like this where it wasn't able to generate enough power, then it's going to make up for it the day after that. So I could do that by day, month, and year. Um, by month is quite useful. If I bring this back, I can see in August how much I've generated and how much I've consumed. Um, July, you can see I've consumed quite a bit, but each month I'm always generating far more than I'm using. So that's exactly the way I want it to be. If, if I've seen these numbers, if they weren't looking like this, then I know I need to either increase the size of my, my solar panel or I need to reduce the amount that I'm using inside the greenhouse. So I also have enabled scheduling on this. Of course, it would make no sense if I had to go manually enable the fans and the pumps. So I have got a scheduler. You can see how I have this running here. So the fans are run five minutes every, I think it's four hours. And then pump one that runs for four minutes every day. And I do that at about 10 to nine in the morning. If it's a hotter day, I would want to increase the amount of time that I have the pump running to give it a bit more water, but four minutes seems to be the sweet spot for, for my chili plants. What I will be adding um, at a future time, so if we, if we have a look here at the schedule, when I add a schedule for one of these, so for pump one, I can give it a duration of hours or minutes, um, and then there's an interval. I want to add an extra bit here that will look for the average temperature for that day. So if the average temperature goes up above 25 degrees, for example, then I might want an extra bit of water coming in in the evening. If we have a look at the, the average temperature at, let's say, 
five o'clock in the afternoon. If the average for that day was 25 degrees, then I want to water again for four minutes. Uh, it won't be too difficult to add that on, but I just haven't had the time to do it yet. And that'll help me um, have a bit more automation here as well. Because at the moment, what I'm doing is if I see that it's been a really hot day, then I will come in here and manually give it a bit more water. So that's pretty much it for today. I have planned a couple other videos to go a bit more in depth, um, specifically around the actual coding that I put together and the website and the reason that I did what I've done um, with, the, with the way that I've set this up. I'm gonna get started on that very soon, so I'll be able to release it. I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you have any comments or any questions, please ask below, I'm more than happy to answer. Please subscribe if you'd like to see some more uh, videos like this and the future videos that I'll be doing about how I actually coded the Wemos and the ESP8266. And if you liked the video, please, I appreciate if you click the like button. Thanks very much. Speak to you again soon.